Let's get started with the session and I'm really, really happy to be talking to you today and sharing some of the ways of how you could showcase your competencies and skills. My name is Christina Hoppner and I work at Catalyst IT in Tevanganoi Atara um, in Aotearoa, Wellington, New Zealand, and have been here for almost 11 years and always in the Mahara project team. Catalyst, though, does a lot of other things, and you can find us in quite a few cities these days with our roughly 350 employees, um, with headquarters here in Wellington, then also an office in Auckland and Christchurch in New Zealand, and uh, offices in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Brighton, in Dublin. Our latest office is one in Canada, which is still more of a remote office due to all the uh, pandemic and not having been able to travel much over the last year. The team and I um, that are looking into uh, showcasing competency skills using portfolios work on Mahara. And Mahara is an electronic portfolio system that was created back in 2006, primarily back then for the tertiary education sector, but since then has also been used in primary schools, uh, secondary schools, and beyond tertiary. Today, I want to talk about more about the concept of using portfolios rather than talking about the technology. Because some of you might already have own technologies that you're comfortable with, that you're familiar with and want to continue using and therefore just might want, uh, maybe just looking for an idea of what you can do better um, beyond a resume rather than making a technology uh, choice or changing your technology tools. So. Let's focus on the content area. When I think about showcasing skills and competencies, what comes to mind immediately is um, that it's creatives that have been doing that for many, many years and actually even centuries. As an example, architecture. If you're an architect, if you want to work with a new client, they oftentimes want to see what you have done in the past. If you're a graphic designer, um, clients also might want to see what you have done previously, whether they like your style, um, whether they like how you approach a project. And that is very similar for, for other creative professions as well. And in particular with artists, designers and architects, we know that they have a portfolio and that that portfolio oftentimes is part of, the, of an application process or a project start process because it is incredibly important to know what they can do and, and also for us to know whether we like that style, whether we want to work with them. That is where a portfolio can help because we are looking beyond a certification or an accreditation or if you're looking at the uh, school or universities beyond a grade because we, we are really getting to know the person. We also know that oftentimes teachers have portfolios. Teaching portfolios have been around since the 1970s and of course the internet didn't exist back then for the majority of us, but they were kept on paper or later on CDs or created on the computer. But over the last um, 10, 15, 20 years, people started also using the internet for them because it's much easier to update a portfolio when it sits online and you can access the content at any point in time and not bound to use it on a particular computer or on a particular mobile device, but can access it from anywhere. Teachers oftentimes have standards that they will need to meet. So um, look, for, look to demonstrate their competencies based on particular criteria. And that is very similar to what we also oftentimes see in the healthcare sector. 
nurses, doctors, pharmacists, occupational therapists, lots of those um, healthcare professions have standards that need to be met in order to become a professional, to become an accredited professional, or in the case of the nurses, a registered nurse, for example. And then also to stay registered. And that oftentimes means that the registration of recertification needs to be done every year, every two years, or every three years. In order, again, to demonstrate, yes, I still have the skills that I had before, or yes, I've participated in X number of professional development workshops and learned from them. And also making self-assessment of how I feel I demonstrate the standards that are part of my profession. So that is a, using a portfolio makes that much easier because with a portfolio, how we see it, um, we are not looking at just filling in check boxes and making sure that we have a quantitative measure, but we are really looking at the quality of those portfolios, looking at the evidence that is being presented and giving feedback on that as well and having the opportunity to have conversations. Now, kind of with those three groups of people, it kind of is a bit obvious that they have portfolios, but what about others? Well, we can see portfolios also being created by professionals in um, other professions, plumbers, um, students that are becoming plumbers or that work in construction apprentices, they keep portfolios as well because again, they work towards standards or unit standards if they are still studying or apprenticing. And um, those requires the require certain skills and competencies to be demonstrated. And demonstrating does not mean just having a certificate, but really saying, okay, here is what I have done and I can showcase that. Another profession, very practical one, is hairdressing. And there we oftentimes see it even in magazines that there is a before shot and there is an after shot. And there we can see very clearly how much skill a hairdresser has in order to produce the end result, which ideally always looks much better than what um, the, the client came in with before. And sometimes you might have also made a decision to go with a particular hairdresser based on what you have seen from them before, how somebody else left the salon. And those are the, and a portfolio can help with that decision making because they could showcase that in their shop or on their website and um, show off what they have learned, how they are, um, how they are dealing with clients and also what um, sort of style they have and work with. And staying in um, another profession, also hospitality, uh, can benefit very greatly from portfolios because again, we showcase skills, we, we demonstrate knife skills or cutting onions or cooking entire meals, yet also how can we work with clients being at reception in a hotel or creating courses that others are going to attend. So lots of different possibilities and lots of different areas, especially in the professional world, where portfolios come in quite handily. So now, is there actually one type of portfolio? Well, and oftentimes, of course, when we think about showcasing competencies, that sounds more like an end result, but a portfolio can be quite different. We can start with a learning portfolio. And that is a portfolio where we really look at the process between getting, or getting from A to B. And with a learning portfolio, we look at reflecting on activities that we have done and making that reflection really part of the learning experience in order to know what we want to improve in future, what we might have to improve. And also things, of course, that have already gone really, really well and things that we want to keep. A second type of portfolio is the assessment portfolio. 
This is oftentimes one that we find with students um, where they get a project and a grade at the end. But instead of the project just being um, a, a quiz at the end where they need to answer multiple choice questions, they do need to detail what they have gone through and showcase what they have learned, put up pictures, and we'll see a couple of portfolios that fit more the learning and assessment portfolio in a little bit. Assessment portfolios are oftentimes very targeted and um, over a short period of time. But students and also apprentices can oftentimes also create a work integrated learning portfolio. So for things like internships or externships, work placements or whatever other language is being used in your profession. And those portfolios are very valuable because they can keep the institution for which they are keeping the portfolio, so they are university or polytechnic, up to date with what they are doing outside of school. And they can also keep their employer up to date of what they are learning, how they are learning, whether they are getting the support that they need. And therefore also invite them in to look at the portfolio, to take a step back from the day-to-day -day work and reflect on, well, how far have I already gotten in my internship? What do I still want to learn? What do I still need to learn? And then of course you can come to the actual showcase portfolio, which is showcasing the best of the best. That oftentimes looks at that end product, but it doesn't mean that it can't also show a little bit of how you got to that space. And the type of that showcase portfolio oftentimes is also the professional certification portfolio because again, we want to show what we are doing really well and um, therefore get the accreditation or retain the accreditation that we, that we are going for. But as you've already been able to see, and I'm stumbling a bit with the, with the language there, so that makes you see these portfolios oftentimes don't exist in isolation. So we don't always just have a learning portfolio or just an assessment portfolio or showcase portfolio or professional certification portfolio, but these types overlap. So a certification portfolio has some characteristics of an assessment portfolio. It can have some characteristics of a learning portfolio, especially if the accreditor requires that learning processes are displayed as part of the competency standard. And a learning portfolio can also flow into an assessment portfolio and have those questions that really come to the point of what have I learned, where am I going, um, why have I done things. And it is that reflection that is at the center of a portfolio and really differentiates it from, say, a project report or a project summary. So what I want to do now is show you a few examples that illustrate some of those portfolio qualities that you can better imagine what that can look like. The first example is from Theresa McKinnon at University of Warwick. And don't worry that you can't read the text. It's not intended for you to read it um, because I'll be pulling out a few phrases from her portfolio. But you're very welcome to look at her portfolio um, after the session because the link is provided and if you use uh, the, the slides or the slides to download, then you can click directly on those links as well. So Teresa's portfolio is actually a recertification portfolio because she um, is a certified member of the Association for Learning Technologists and created an initial portfolio. And this one here is for the recertification. So it is much shorter portfolio than her original one. And now she's in the process of remaining that certified member. And so what she demonstrates really well in her portfolio, I find, is the language that we are using and also therefore shows that her portfolio is created for a particular audience and that she's not showing us everything. For example, she says, a highlight of my professional career is. So she is picking one particular instance 
that she wants to talk about. She's not giving us everything that she has done over her decades of her career and makes us look through everything and try to find, well, what is important to, uh, to Teresa? What does she want to show us? Where is that particular evidence? But she really draws our attention to one particular thing that for this particular certification portfolio is important to her to highlight. She also says, the point at which I realized. So again, she is looking back at all her experiences and reflecting on all of these experiences, but pulling out one particular point, one particular area that shows us incredibly well why she should remain a certified member. And that is almost like looking at your computer and saying, okay, here's my computer, I have all my files on it, and you give that to somebody else, and then expect them to go through your computer and see what they can find. And they might find something that is relevant, they might not find something that is relevant, and they might miss the thing that you thought is the most important one because they didn't go into subdirectory 25. Whereas in a portfolio, what you do is you look at your computer and all the files that are on it and pull out the ones that are the most important ones for you. And those you hand over to another person on a USB stick or in our case on an electronic website. And that revisiting is very important. We are looking back, we are reflecting, we are thinking back because by doing so, Will we learn, well, what can we do better next time? Um, what do we want to keep the same? And lastly, learning and also reflection doesn't always happen on its own or when we are just on our own, but we learn with others and we learn from the feedback from others. That doesn't mean that we have to take on every feedback or every comment that we receive, but it is certainly something that uh, we can consider and then look at our learning and see, is that relevant for me or is it not relevant? And so Teresa had um, implemented that practice of receiving feedback and looking for mentoring opportunities, and she found those very helpful because they furthered her in her thinking. And so all of these really, really short phrases are a very good indicator that her portfolio has been created for a specific reason and that she also picked out the important things that she wanted to make and that's why it allows her to just have a recertification portfolio of about a page and not take us through lots and lots of readings or videos or images to look at and then making us um, interpret them, but maybe not necessarily getting to the point that she's making. Now, a couple of other uh, examples. Uh, this one is from a student at Dublin City University. Uh, she is in an education degree and looks at local studies and looks at um, what she can find out about the area that she lives in. In contrast to Teresa, she has a much larger portfolio that consists of six pages, and she's created those six pages to organize her content, therefore guiding us as reader through her portfolio very well and drawing the attention to particular things on a page. What Chelsea does here is that she has text and pretty much has a project description of what she has found, puts her findings in, uses uh, images and other files, video, in this case, what she has found online, and uh, looking at bringing all of these things together, organizing, in, organizing them in a way that makes sense for her project, and that takes us through her narrative. She also uploads pictures, uh, some of which she will have taken herself. And then we can go through her portfolio. 
Her portfolio in ways is different than uh, the, the one from Teresa, of course. It's not going for a certification. She's created it as part of a course, and therefore it looks to be more of, a, of an assessment portfolio for a project where she documents her project and what she thinks about the local studies and what she's finding out in her portfolio. Another example is the one here from, from a student who is looking at how food can explain why socialism failed in Poland. This portfolio is also a project-based portfolio where she goes through the, the history of um, food in Poland and how it, how it influenced culture. And then the very fantastic thing that uh, this student does is she shows us uh, her socialist cookbook quite a long way up to, to Europe, so it's a kind of slow connection at the moment. Probably everybody is online, but once the page is loaded, we will see that uh, she created a gallery of pictures and also has her own cookbook that she is going through and she is showing us a recipe that she follows from, from her grandmother. And that can be included in her portfolio. So we'll see very nicely what she is doing, how she goes about cooking that. And this is real evidence of the student working through that portfolio, uh, through that recipe, which it's not that easily done oftentimes in a learning management system, but where we can have a portfolio to show that evidence, show it in many different multimedia ways and not just text. Now, if you're looking at a professional certification portfolio, how could an organization go about setting one of those up? Well, one possibility is to use a template. Because if you're thinking, well, um, we have 400 nurses and then a few hundred doctors, and, or if you're in an organization we are, or in a professional organization where you might have hundreds or thousands of people that need to create portfolios, asking them to sit in front of a blank screen and then adding their content might be quite tricky because so people have different questions and might not know where to start. So what an electronic portfolio platform can do is give that guidance. Um, that means that you can create a template that everybody gets either automatically or can uh, copy into their own account and you can guide them through that portfolio. So in our case here, we have a portfolio consisting of just two pages for the time being. More pages can be added throughout the certification time frame. And that first page is a very simple one where instructions can be given. And in this case, I'm not having a real portfolio because those often are, those are always, uh, always have the IP from an organization. And I wanted to show you more the idea of what, what you can do in a template. But you have a first page. And the nice thing about doing all of that electronically is you can add instructions. Therefore, keeping everybody focused on the portfolio and not sending them off to another site where they might need to download a document or read an entire um, long page when they just need a particular paragraph in order to work on a competency or demonstrate their skills for that and write a narrative around it or find multimedia evidence for it. By keeping everything on the portfolio page, there's no room for error what needs to be done. And you can also provide the spaces where content might need to sit. In our case here, Paula already uploaded a video that um, was taken while she was teaching. And she can add other pieces of evidence very easily by even deciding um, on what that evidence shall look like. Does she want to have text or does she want to upload an image or link to another 
electronic video or, or YouTube on, online video, I mean, or write a journal entry or any other possibilities of her for adding her content. So it is up to her to decide, which is fantastic because when you are on a smartphone, you might not necessarily want to type an entire essay and or even just 300, 400 words, but just want to record the, your voice and upload that audio recording to a portfolio or make a quick video recording because typing even just a small paragraph will just take longer on mobile. Whereas when, if somebody is more comfortable in the written word, then they can type away on a keyboard. And by using a template, you can leave the decision to the portfolio author so that they can choose a medium that they're most comfortable with, um, that also caters to, to what they want to show and therefore give them the biggest freedom, yet allowing you as um, organization to also have all the relevant uh, points of a certification portfolio covered. And then what um, she can do once the portfolio content has been added for all of the pages or even just for one page, in, in our case for this portfolio, um, Polly can sign off on it, can say, yes, I'm done with this page. She can also sign off the second page if she likes, and she can give somebody else access to that portfolio so that another person, typically her assessor, can review the portfolio and make comments on it. Therefore, help her understand whether she still needs to work more on her skills or whether she's already achieved um, a particular standard. Now all of that comes down to what you really want to do in your portfolio and what we do in a portfolio from what you have seen so far is that we collect and organize and tell stories and these stories re um, contain reflections and also connect to other people. And so through the collection, organization, reflection and connection, we can tell those stories and make sense of what we have learned or what we are in the process of learning um, so that we can also showcase how certain experiences relate to each other and therefore how we can also transfer knowledge and how we have worked with that. And so all of that can be done in an electronic environment because there you can reuse files, repurpose reflections, make them available, create different portfolios, copy a portfolio, and then even share that across organizations so that you get that feedback from others. If you're looking at um, just how Mahara as one of those electronic tools does that, there are five basic activities that relate back to that definition of folio thinking. The first one though is not the collection. Um, the first activity is actually the creation, is creating your content. And that oftentimes of course is done outside of an electronic platform, but can also be done directly in the portfolio platform by typing text or linking um, content from one area in the portfolio to another. Then of course, oftentimes the bigger part is the collection and that means uploading files or linking to external videos. Um, sometimes students might create cartoons that they want to embed in their portfolios or maybe you have been in an interview and therefore want to showcase that in your portfolio, then that might be sitting externally. But the nice thing about keeping it all in a portfolio is that everything is in one place. So you don't need to send somebody off to, to watch a video on YouTube or Vimeo and then send them off to your blog and send them to LinkedIn. No, you can have them all in one place. You can still have the connection to all of those um, other websites. So from LinkedIn, for example, you can 
put a link to your portfolio so that people can see all of that evidence in context. Um, but not, you will have everything in one place and therefore organized really well because the organization is the curation of your evidence. You're not sending somebody just to your um, video channel or just to your entire blog, but you tell them this particular blog post or this particular event was incredibly important for me to showcase a particular skill and that is what I want you to focus on. You're very welcome to watch all the other things, but right now this is what I'm focusing on and here is a reflection going with that um, so that you also know why this particular piece of evidence is important to me. And that curation element for me really is the heart of the portfolio because there we get to know the why. Why is something important for us? Why do we want to point it out? But as I've said also, um, conversations are very important. Having conversations with other people either directly on your portfolio or in person. By using an electronic portfolio, we are not relegating conversations to the electronic space. It will still be very good and is oftentimes even recommended, I find, um, to have in-person conversations or synchronous conversations um, via webinar software in order to discuss the portfolio and what has been learned, to discuss the evidence, seek clarifications, um, because that, is, that ha keeps that human touch. Though some comments though can also be left online on the actual artifacts so that the, these comments then become part of the portfolio and might also influence then of what is um, being done afterwards. And in Mahara at, at least we also have the possibility to actually set up collaborative spaces, collaborative portfolios, uh, project portfolios created by several people in order for, um, for yeah, um, portfolio creators to come together in communities of learning or communities of practice and share their experiences, create resources that um, they want to share with everybody, uh, or also when they have been working on a project together, reflect um, all together and not just have to do that in a single personal space. Now, what does that mean altogether? If you're looking at our own learning story, why is a portfolio important? For me, a portfolio is important because it shows real evidence. And yes, if you're doing a painting or so, it, can, it is only a, an electronic reflection of it, but it is still, we can still see the evidence. We can still see what has been produced rather than just saying, okay, yep, they got an A in, in sculpture making, we actually can say, oh yes, they got an A and I really like this sculpture or this is a really cool artist that I wanted to work with. We can also see what others think about it if comments are made available and not just to the portfolio author. And of course, as learner, as portfolio creator, I can hear from other people and while in person is really nice as well, of course, the leaving comments on the portfolio itself will help me remember those conversations and then have, that com have those comments integrated into my learner story. And of course, by creating a portfolio and talking about the evidence, I get to know the story behind the learning. Why was this important? Why have I gained this skill? Or why is this competency um, completed for me? And I'm also not telling everybody everything, but I'm pointing out the highlights of what is important, making it easy for portfolio assessors to know where they need to look. So we've heard very good stories from those using professional portfolio certification portfolios in particular, that the, the time for reviewing such portfolios was cut down sometimes in half or even more 
and going through the evidence because doing that electronically is much faster. They can pick it up at um, other points again and can go through the, the evidence much more easily than they could um, when it was on printed out on paper. And I think to a large degree that is because when you're working online, there's even more the, the, the attention to detail and what is being shared. And um, therefore, one can really dig to those areas. Now you might want to ask, well, where can I start? There's lots of places for you to get started with, depending on whether you are already using portfolios, um, just in paper format or in a spreadsheet or asking people to send you files, or whether you're thinking about whether that could be something in your organization that could be useful, or whether you just think about creating a portfolio for yourself. There are many different possibilities and some organizations do use it also for a performance review, especially when it is tied to certain professional standards because then it gives um, people or it gives staff the opportunity to align it to the professional standards and then collect the evidence and take that as basis for performance review um, conversations so that it is not just a tick box exercise. If you want to know about more, or if you want to know more about portfolios in general, then there are a few resources that you will see in the um, in the slides that you have access to. The first one is in particular looking at an example of portfolios being used in the workforce here in New Zealand with nurses, and the other resources are ideas of what you could do either for assessment portfolios, getting started with portfolio activities in general, more geared towards the university sector rather than um, a, a workplace, but there's still very important and useful information in there in terms of how to go about it, including feedback, um, technical requirements or questions you might want to ask. And then in the second row, you have also digital ethics considerations that you might want to take into, into account or will have to take into account when working electronically because some information might be too confidential to share in a portfolio. Say um, you're working with a patient, it's not necessarily good to show their face and talk about them freely, which of course is also a professional standard to adhere to, to not do that. And so the, the digital ethics principles give also some guidance on hand on how that could be handled uh, in, in a privacy respecting way and can be dealt with nicely. And the last resource is the learning portfolio, which specifically focuses on the portfolio that is more development process oriented and geared towards learning and supporting the learning of, um, in this case, usually university students, but it can also be used in, in workplaces, in my opinion. And if you have any questions, we still have about 15 minutes until the top of the hour, so you're very welcome to ask them. And if you do have to go away quickly or don't want to ask your question in a more public forum, you're very welcome to send me an email and we can have conversations about um, the, the topic afterwards. And I look forward to engaging with you and learning from you what you're currently doing in terms of showcasing what you're good at, um, what you have improved maybe over the last year, and how all of that flows into your professional and also personal life.